Thank you very much, and a really warm welcome to all of you uh, here to Guildhall for tonight's, uh, for this evening's seminar on Build Back Better, online civil justice after the pandemic. Or as someone pointed out to me last night, perhaps more positively, Build Forward uh, Better. Now, I am, as you've heard, uh, Catherine McGuinness, Policy Chair here at the City of London Corporation, but I'm also, or have been for most of my, uh, uh, my working life, a, uh, a working uh, solicitor. And we at the City Corporation are really delighted to be able to host this seminar uh, tonight in partnership with the Bingham Centre for the Rule of Law and the Magna Carta Trust. And to welcome our distinguished panellists, the Master of the Roles, Sir Geoffrey Voss, the Executive Director of the World Justice Project, Elizabeth Anderson, and the President of the Law Society, I, Stephanie Boyce. To no one will we deny or delay right or justice. So reads Clause 40 of Magna Carta. Over the centuries, London has made many globally influential contributions to the rule of law, often in times of crisis. Since the time of Magna Carta, it's been the site of formative struggles to develop rule of law ideas and, the innovative, uh, and innovative legal frameworks and the institutions needed to give effect to these. Indeed, we often say, and we really mean, that the rule of law is one of our most precious assets and it's one of the bedrocks of the, UK, uh, the UK's strengths, for example, as a business centre. The COVID-19 pandemic has severely challenged our legal institutions, along with wider society. And tonight we'll be looking at the acceleration of legal innovation in the sphere of online justice and consider its future after the pandemic. Across fields from commercial law to family law, critical questions have arisen about how to harness online technologies in a manner that best gives effect to access to justice and equal protection and enforcement of legal rights for all. And it has been impressive to see how this difficult period has acted as a catalyst and has really moved us in a positive uh, direction. The reality is that, as with most uh, uh, pre-pandemic practices, uh, the delivery of justice will probably not return to its pre-pandemic norms. However, there's clearly a balance to be struck between taking on the positive aspects of the changes that we've uh, been through while discarding those which have hampered the delivery of justice. We ourselves touched uh, on this in a report to, which we produced about a year ago, London Recharged, uh, looking at what we needed to do for the future. And we noticed uh, the importance, we noted the importance of taking stock of the lessons learnt uh, from the last uh, 18 months and to use this to help transform, for example, the provision of legal justice, of civil justice going forward. And we really may remain committed to this action and to working with court users and government to gather and use this information not only to improve existing courts, but also to ensure that future courts can incorporate uh, these lessons into their development, as well as embracing the emerging technologies of their time. And this is a real question for us, because as you will, uh, many of you will know, we're actually in the, uh, in the course of building a new courts complex uh, for the court service uh, on, uh, just off Fleet Street. What's very encouraging are the proactive steps being taken by government, regulators and industry to explore and remove barriers to innovation. And these include measures such as the creation of the Law Tech Delivery Panel and now Law Tech UK, a collaboration between that original panel, the Ministry of Justice and Tech Nation aimed at transforming the UK legal sector through technology. Their ongoing work through the development of the Law Tech Sandbox creation of the digital dispute resolution rules and the published legal statement on crypto assets and smart contracts has really put the UK on the map as a global leader in legal innovation. The feasibility study carried out on the potential for an online dispute resolution platform to support SMEs seeking recovery of late payment of debts has also helped to demonstrate what could be possible in terms of online civil justice. The City of London Corporation is involved itself. Uh, we're involved in and we support the work of LawTech UK. We also set up our own LawTech sounding board, which brings together legal practitioners across private practice and in-house, as well as representatives from LawTechs, the Law Society and government. 
And we've been running a scheme, Innovation Ambassadors, uh, which brings people together to develop innovative ideas. I've dropped in on a couple of the sessions while we were running that. It was tremendously exciting to see the collaboration between, uh, and the joint thinking that was going on between uh, lawyers and uh, law tech specialists. And, and some of the really useful, positive ideas that were being developed. Actually, I have to say, I rather regretted being at the back end of my legal career rather than right at the start of it, uh, when I think a Tipex bottle was about the uh, furthest we got in law tech. <laughs> and very useful it was too, I might say. <laughs> In order to build back better, uh, we really must look both uh, backwards and forwards, and we must incorporate the lessons learnt from the past 18 months uh, whilst increasing our awareness of the emerging technologies that are coming down the pipeline to transform the way in which civil justice is delivered, increasing access to justice and strengthening our commitment to the rule of law. So it gives me very great pleasure to start this evening off properly uh, by uh, introducing the master of the roles, Sir Geoffrey Voss, to speak first. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. I'll put the gavel to one side, unaccustomed as I am to using one. Um, it's a real pleasure to be back at the Guild Hall. Actually, the last time I spoke here in this very room, actually at the other end of it, uh, was when the Lord Chief Justice and I, alongside the City Corporation, launched Law Tech UK's legal statement on crypto assets and smart contracts, to which Catherine has already referred. And there was really quite a big gathering here. And I'm pleased to say that that publication has been very well received across the world and has been endorsed by courts as far distant as London and New Zealand. And now, nearly two years on, uh, we, it seems as if it's a, a many, many years ago, but it's only two years ago, and we are recovering from a terrible pandemic. But it will, I think, be shown ultimately to have changed our civil justice system forever. Before COVID, most civil claims were determined in court before district and circuit judges around the country. About 20% of hearings, mostly those estimated at 30% or less, 30 minutes or less, uh, were dealt with on the telephone. By mid-2021, district and circuit judges were resolving some 80% of civil claims in remote video hearings, with only longer hearings over two hours uh, generally taking place face to face. And this was a great achievement, although actually it didn't change the decision-making process. But it did save the costs and expenses of traveling and waiting around in courthouses for lawyers, parties, and witnesses alike. I'll come back in a minute to the decision-making process itself. Now, I've only a short time available tonight, but I want to consider the future of civil justice, bearing in mind some of these developments. Civil justice is a huge firmament. It amounts to many millions of disputes each year, from the very small to the very large. The biggest of commercial cases can take months to resolve in the business and property courts at the Rolls Building. But the vast bulk of cases are really very small indeed, from disputes about gas bills to small building claims to employment issues or property or boundary disputes. More than half of all small claims dealt with in the county court are worth less than £500. And in these circumstances, judges and lawyers have, I think, been right to focus on access to justice. Every citizen, as Catherine reminded us, has the right to justice. Article 40, as Catherine reminded us, of Magna Carta famously made clear, to no one will we sell and to no one will we deny or delay right or justice. So every citizen must be able to have access to our courts without undue delay or at disproportionate cost. The question, however, is whether even assuming we can undertake remote hearings for small claims, the cost and delay of holding them 
is really making justice accessible. In my view, our justice system should still be more agile and streamlined. It will come as no surprise to anyone that I see that agility and streamlining being provided by an online justice system with three interconnecting layers. I see the first online layer as a website regulated by a new online rules committee to which any potential claimant, individual, consumer, employee, spouse, SME, or big business can go. We can call it, if you want, claims are us for the sake of argument. It will direct anybody to the right online location to resolve their dispute, whether that's a court, an ombuds process, a pre-action portal, or whatever. And the second online layer is a series of online pre-action protocols, ideally accredited by the new online rules committee, and are aimed at resolving disputes of particular kinds without the need for court-based litigation. Many pre-action portals already exist. The personal injury portal deals with some 600,000 cases a year. The whiplash portal started last May has already dealt with some 60,000 cases. Ombuds portals deal with every kind of industry issues, whether financial services, energy, telecoms, or healthcare. ACAS deals with employment disputes online. And, they, um, and, and in the end, there will be literally 50 or 100 online pre-action portals aimed at one thing, just one thing, not dispute, but resolution. Those cases that are not resolved by these portals will have created a data set that can be directly transmitted by API into the OCMC, or Online Civil Money Claims, or Damages Online Court Systems. And the third online layer, is being, which is being created as I speak through HMCTS and its reform program, we've already got OCMC, Online Civil Money Claims, with more than 200,000 online money claims already going through the system, many already resolved. We've got damages online, where the case numbers are now rising sharply, and we've got public and private family cases online. And there will be possession online, employment tribunals online, immigration online, and public um, uh, uh, and family as well, as I've said. In all this, of course, there must be help for the vulnerable and those unable to utilize digital systems. But I don't believe we should delay or worse still, stop building and improving those systems just because an ever decreasingly small percentage of the population finds difficulty using them. We should provide additional assistance, of course, but let's be honest, almost all young people get everything they want on their mobile phone. And by the way, the systems that HMCTS is building are highly intuitive and user-friendly. Finally, we need to consider what decision-making should look like in the online world. And I'm far from sure, I'm afraid, that every case that needs a judicial decision merits a face-to-face -face or even a remote hearing in front of a judge. As I said at the beginning, half the cases in the county court are worth less than 500 pounds. If, as at present, we allow such cases two hours of district judge time, that delays more significant cases being heard. Many of the parties to these small claims just want an answer as soon as possible. And I think we should consider requiring the parties to these very small claims to undertake a mediation process, either online or by video or telephone, and if that fails, to have their cases resolved by the judge on the documents, hopefully online documents, without oral submissions or evidence, with rights of appeal limited to points of law. And I accept that 500 pounds is a lot of money to many people, but even so, 
small disputes can be resolved in that way. For bigger cases, we need to be more innovative and imaginative too. Lengthy in-person trials have become unaffordable, except in cases worth many millions. The process ought to be more focused on identifying the issues that divide the parties and resolving them one by one, online or remotely in many cases, so as to speed up resolution. There need to be continuous mediated interventions aimed at resolving every dispute at the earliest possible stage. I'm pleased to say also that I have asked the Civil Justice Council to start an in-depth consideration of the online justice system so as to ensure that we take advantage of its capabilities and flexibility. There are so many ways in which online justice can be made better. For example, decision trees instead of lengthy old-fashioned pleadings, cutting straight to the identification of issues, asynchronous online exchanges between the parties, their lawyers and experts and the judge, and most important of all, the proposal for mediated resolutions at every online stage. So what conclusions can be drawn? If we create an accessible online civil justice system with three layers that I've mentioned, we will be the only major economy that has done so in the world. Ex access to justice has major economic and social advantages for our society. Individuals and small businesses involved in disputes are agitated, often psychologically disturbed. Resolving disputes quickly and cheaply allows the parties to return to their normal business and personal lives and to be more productive. Disputes are, in short, a serious economic drag. An agile, streamlined, online, civil, family and tribunals justice system is an objective that adds value to our society and I hope we will all be working towards its realisation in a very short time frame. Thank you. Can I now hand over to Elizabeth Anderson of the World Justice Project to take the seminar forward. Good evening and thank you for the opportunity to be with you and participate in this timely and important discussion. It's wonderful to hear about the innovative forward thinking and doing that is underway here. I'm, I'm sure I'm going to learn a lot. A principal focus of the World Justice Project is to provide the global rule of law community with data about the rule of law. What is it? Where do we have it? And how do we strengthen it? So this will be the focus of my remarks tonight, to share recent data we have collected and the insights that it provides about gaps in access to justice and the promise of technology to fill them. Let me begin with some pre-pandemic data as a baseline for our discussion. In 2019, the World Justice Project published Global Insights on Access to Justice. It was the result of legal needs surveys carried out um, in 101 countries, over 100,000 households, were asked in this first ever effort to get a handle on their everyday uh, justice needs. We asked what were the legal problems that they were facing, how were they solving them or not, and what impact did these problems have in their lives. Often we look at justice systems from the perspective of institutions, from the courts, the judges' perspective, the prosecutors, the lawyers, and we look at data that captures our experience, caseloads and the like. At WJP, we have found that taking this people-centered approach to justice through legal needs surveys of households yields important insights. So what were those insights in 2019? First, we found that legal problems are widely prevalent. Roughly half of people globally in this study were found to have had a legal problem in the past two years. The most common problems were those relating to consumer issues, housing, money, and debt. 
Second, most people do not turn to courts and lawyers to solve these problems. Indeed, in our survey, only 29% obtained information, advice, or representation to solve their problem. Most of them had these problems persisting as a result. There were many reasons, many impediments to their turning to the formal system. But by far, the most significant impediment was the lack of knowledge. Fewer than one third, just 29%, understood their problem as legal, as a problem that the legal system had a solution for them. They generally tended to think of their problems as maybe community problems or just bad luck. Third, these unsolved problems have significant consequences in people's lives. 29% of the people we surveyed experienced a stress-related or physical illness as a result of their legal problem. And these legal problems caused job loss, income loss, or relocation in roughly one in five cases. Finally, the poor and marginalized populations in the countries studied were affected more. They were more likely to have these problems, less likely to uh, turn to the formal system to solve them, more likely to have their problems persist, and more likely to suffer negative consequences. Based on this study, we calculated an estimate of the global justice gap, those with unmet justice needs, at 5.1 billion people, including 1.4 billion people who have unmet civil justice needs. So pre-pandemic, we already had a serious access to justice problem. Fast forward now uh, to 18 months into this historic public health uh, crisis. And we can uh, ask what is the pandemic, uh, what, what impact has it had on this justice gap? Many of the most prevalent legal needs pre-pandemic think housing and debt, for example, have been exacerbated by this crisis. Anecdotally, legal aid providers have reported surging needs even as courts have struggled to meet those needs. We see this in our rule of law data as well. And here I'd like to share the results of a study published just last week, WJP's um, annual World Justice Project uh, Rule of Law Index. This annual study surveys households and practitioners, again, looking for that on the ground experience of the justice system. And we measure, uh, based on those surveys, the justice system in 139 countries across these eight factors, including uh, civil justice. Last week's report was the first to be published since the outbreak of the pandemic. And so it provides us with a helpful picture of what has happened to the rule of law and access to justice in this period. Just let me share a few high-level findings relevant to our discussion tonight. First, during this pandemic period, we are seeing a significant spreading of what has been a multi-year decline in the rule of law globally. In this map, those countries improving are in blue, those regressing are orange, and you can see the latter significantly outnumber the former. In all, 74.2% of countries so, um, saw their rule of law index score decline during this pandemic period. The trend holds for every region in the world and for rich and poor countries alike. Second, an important trend in this data uh, relates to declines in civil justice. This year, 70% of the 139 countries we studied saw their civil justice scores decline. We saw particular impacts in the timeliness of administrative, civil, and criminal justice, with 94% of countries declining in at least one of these three areas, shown in the map in red. And in the, in the bars here, the red are the number of countries um, with uh, declines in each of those three areas of timeliness. Third, discrimination has been on the rise. There we go. Uh, during this period, with 67% of countries seeing a decline in the index indicator measuring unequal treatment in absence of discrimination. To the extent that the justice gap disproportionately affects minorities, we can expect this problem to have worsened in this period. Again, here blue is good, orange or yellow reflects increasing uh, discrimination. So, 
We've seen the situation go from bad to worse. Where might we find some hope for the future? Certainly, as the organizers of tonight's discussion have highlighted, the pandemic period has seen an unprecedented amount of technological innovation in the delivery of legal services and dispute resolution. Might we see some of that innovation to build back better and make progress to close that pre-pandemic justice gap? There is indeed promise in these developments. Earlier this year, the World Justice Project convened a global competition, the World Justice Challenge, in which we sought to essentially crowdsource good ideas, what was working in uh, addressing rule of law and access to justice challenges in the face of the pandemic. And a notable feature of the most exciting challenge projects reflected here, the 30 finalists, was many of them were using innovations in technology. So we've heard about some of the exciting ideas here in the UK, but you can see this is a, a global phenomenon. Just one example, the Justice Defenders Program working in Kenya and Uganda before the pandemic was working in prisons to provide paralegal assistance to pretrial detainees. Um, but with the pandemic, they saw uh, the back case backlog surge and worked with the prisons and with the courts to facilitate online proceedings to keep those pretrial hearings going forward and facilitated 13,000 virtual pretrial proceedings uh, in the first uh, six months of the pandemic. While such innovations are exciting, there is not yet significant data about the impact of technology on the justice gap. At a macro level, technologically advanced jurisdictions seem to be faring better in our rule of law index. They're proving more resilient to the pandemic stresses. And yet there is much more to learn about what specifically works and importantly for whom. And herein lies an important caveat and caution for this work going forward. It brings me really full circle to where I started and to underscore the importance of an evidence-based, people-centered approach to embracing technology and online civil justice. The kind of data that we get from legal needs surveys tell us important things about the problem we're trying to solve and how we might do so. And this holds for embracing technology as well. Recall that significant numbers of people are not turning to lawyers and courts to solve their problems. Unless online proceedings address the underlying causes preventing them from turning to the formal system, it may, prove, it may improve the timeliness of justice for those who are already using the system, but it will not move the needle on unmet justice needs. If, for example, as the data suggest, a major impediment to meeting people's justice needs is that they do not understand their problems as legal, they don't know that the system has a solution for them, then technology may be uh, uh, the answer, but it is more likely to be an app that explains their legal rights and gives them a roadmap to redressing them as opposed to a simple online proceeding. In short, we should fit the technology to the need that we see in the data. Finally, people-centered justice provide important insight into the experience of different constituencies of our justice systems. If poor and other marginalized populations are disproportionately affected by the justice gap, how can technology be deployed to meet their needs? It's not a given that technology uh, excludes minorities and other, not, other marginalized populations, but it might if innovations are not intentionally designed with their needs in mind. So those are a few observations of what the data tell us about the challenge before us in meeting civil justice needs and about the importance of people-centered data to inform our efforts to harness the promise of technology to meet them. Thank you for the opportunity to share these uh, introductory thoughts and I look forward to further exchange in our discussion. Let me uh, turn then to Stephanie Boyce to take our conversation forward. So thank you very much for that, Elizabeth. Um, and good evening, everyone. 
So one of the privileges of being president of the Law Society of England and Wales is being able to appear alongside distinguished panels such as today's uh, or this evening's. As we grapple with these pressing questions we are all considering around the use of technology in the civil justice system. So what are the implications of technology? How can we enhance and protect our legal rights as we adopt new technologies and practices in civil justice? What should the services that facilitate online justice look like? Our civil justice system is open to you. Whether you are an international corporation, protecting your intellectual property, or a tenant seeking redress in a housing dispute, it touches everyone's life, underpinning our economy and providing the foundation of fairness in our society. So we should not consider these questions lightly. Necessity is often called the mother of invention, and COVID-19 presented a challenge like no other to how our civil courts operate and how we work and serve the needs of our clients. In response, we have seen extensive innovation from our courts and practitioners alike. And during the height of lockdown, our business and property courts dealt with 85% of cases, both interlocutory and final hearings remotely. And these hearings were efficient. Informally gathered statistics for hearings during lockdown showed that some 50% of all business and property remote hearings lasted less than one hour and 70% 70, 70 lasted less than two hours. So looking to the future, remote hearings will undoubtedly form a larger part of our civil justice system. But as we make this transition, we must carefully consider the types of cases and hearings which are most suitable for remote participation. Data must be attentively collected on the impact remote hearings have, with particular focus on those without representation and those who are vulnerable or have additional needs. The process before a complaint gets to court will likely change too, potentially with a greater focus on alternative dispute resolution. Sir Geoffrey has often spoken about the need for appropriate and accessible dispute resolution methods with a single point of online entry for the system. It is also true, as he has noted previously, that as the expectations of our population change and adapt, especially around the use of technology in their own lives, the justice system must move with them. ADR methods may become a greater feature in our civil justice system, and they certainly have a role to play. Some disputes may benefit from being diverted from the courts. In commercial cases or cross-border disputes, these methods can be particularly effective. There is huge scope to explore the role of technological innovation in this space and how we can apply ADR to these sorts of cases. But in other instances, cases involving less well-resourced individuals or particularly vulnerable clients we must be cautious about the impact innovation will have upon them. Being able to access the courts is a fundamental right that cannot and should not be weakened. We should always aim to solve disputes at the earliest possible stages. And in many instances, a solicitor can help a client to understand their options and guide them through mediation early on to an equitable resolution that avoids the court entirely. The role of a solicitor is to serve the best interest of their clients, and we of course recognise that this duty will not always be best served through the court. Proceedings can at times be acrimonious or stressful, and our profession will always look to embrace innovation and changes where they will bring about the best outcome for clients and ensure access to justice. But on occasion, even with the best online services and digital tools, a dispute will require the ruling of the court to settle it. If you cannot enforce your rights th through every avenue, then they may as well not exist. And when thinking about that all-important role of practitioners in the online civil justice system, we must not forget the importance of face-to-face -face advice. For those with the most sensitive of problems, for example in the family courts or for the most vulnerable, 
face-to-face -face advice is irreplaceable. And the Law Society's latest civil legal aid desert maps have unfortunately shown that areas where legal advice cannot easily be accessed continue to grow. 88% of the population does not have access to an education legal aid provider in their local authority area. This means that many will not have a solid grasp of their legal options and may well end up in court as litigants in person. Instead, they could have been supported through an earlier remedy by a solicitor had one been involved from the very beginning. And while we look to more technological solutions, we should not ignore the essential role face-to-face -face advice can play in guiding individuals to the best outcome. In addition to properly funding our civil legal aid system so it can meet demand, co-location of services can be important too. And this would enable legal advice to be accessible in health centres or community hubs to stop anyone falling through the cracks and only receiving advice at a crisis point in their disputes. And as we see more components of our civil justice system move online, legal aid and the advice and assistance it provides to those navigating the system will become all the more important. Technology is a useful tool and the pandemic has proved that as it, as it kept the wheels of justice turning and maintained our connections to our colleagues, our clients and at times was the only link to our families and friends too. To truly harness and embed the advantages of this tool, we need to think carefully about what we want our online services to look like, how services are structured, how users navigate them, and the physical infrastructure that underpins them will become vital areas of thought in our future civil justice system if they are not already. As we build online services, we must design them with the ability to screen and triage clients effectively, understanding their problems, the most effective way to help them, and where the intervention of a solicitor is needed. This would quickly identify those who need specialist advice at their earliest point and ensure that they get the help they need. Organisations that are working in this space must review how data can be shared among them, ensuring that services are not duplicating each other and clients do not have to repeat processes again and again to seek help. We must also carefully consider the practicalities of technology. It is no use having the most advanced online services with the best virtual tools if clients cannot access them because they do not have a reliable internet connection. And I'm sure everyone has dealt with the irritation of the cutoff of Zoom calls and not being able to take themselves off mute. This quickly advances from an irritation to a serious worry if you are in the midst of a legal dispute. The government has made strides in its rollout of digital infrastructure as part of the levelling up agenda and we have called for this to continue so that everyone can take part in the technological re revolution following the pandemic. We want to prevent communities from being left behind, cut off from justice. So thank you very much for listening to me this evening. It's been a pleasure to consider the future of online civil justice and how we maintain, protect and ideally enhance our legal rights as we harness new technologies. Thank you. Well, thank you very much to our speakers. That's been a real uh, tour de force. We've heard from Sir, uh, Sir Geoffrey about the exciting potential of the use of technology in, uh, in, in providing access uh, to justice. We've heard sobering news uh, from Elizabeth on the justice gap and the risk indeed of widening it, if we're not careful. And uh, from Stephanie, uh, you've carried on with that theme. Yes, the scope for uh, remote hearings and for uh, 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 alternative dispute resolution, but the risk of leaving people out and the importance of ongoing face-to-face -face advice uh, and the role of practitioners. So we've got, I'm af afraid, only 20 minutes for a further discussion on that, which I think will just whet your um, appetite uh, rather than satisfy it. But there will be time after that to talk over a glass at the back. Can I invite our speakers up to the stage uh, for a, a bit more of a discussion? Thank you. 
couple of questions from me. Ah, the mic's working, excellent. Just a couple of questions from me uh, before I hand over to the floor. Um, and I'd really uh, just like to pursue a bit this question of people who might be excluded, people who might be uh, challenged by using these online um, uh, resources. Any thoughts on what we need to do, besides, of course, making sure people have access to the tech and to the reliable connection? Any thoughts, for example, on what sort of education we might need to offer so that the public can actually access uh, you know, justice for themselves? Anybody like to start on that? Stephanie. Perhaps I, I might. I mean, you know, there's a big digital skills gap in this, in, in this country. Um, and, and as I touched on, you know, uh, the internet uh, issues, there's, there's still huge swathes of the country, up and down England and Wales, where in, individuals, households do not have uh, uh, access to the internet, full stop. But we also have the digital skills gap. So the concern is, is that if we are going to, and of course, you know, one of the things that I think has become prevalent during the pandemic is where this push to push everything online, you know, if you try to get in contact uh, uh, with your local authority, uh, uh, the utility company, uh, it all directs you to the chat box online. Oh, chat box, sorry, not chat box. The chat bot online, which is all good and well if you have a simple issue. But if you have a complex issue, um, and, and I've come across a number of those. Uh, um, you know, uh, I remember a, a story that somebody told me, uh, and they were uh, during the, the height of the, you know, the pandemic, although we still are, but you know, they were in the pub, uh, and a gentleman was sat there on his own. Um, and you know, for a long time, people couldn't figure out why this gentleman was sat there on his own. No food, no drink. Um, and eventually, somebody went over to ask this gentleman, you know, you know, what's going on? You know, why do you have, you know, because people thought he was people watching, people just thought he was just sitting there, uh, passing time. But when they asked why he was there with no food, no drink, it was because he didn't have a smartphone. He couldn't order. You know, so it's those sorts of things that we have to, you know, um, so for some of us, it works really well. And when I think of, you know, my mother, um, you know, she's got a smartphone, but, uh, and I've shown her how many times to order her prescription online. Um, but, you know, it's not sinking in. Um, and she's heavily reliant on me to do that for her. And these are, it's, you know, people like my mother, and we've probably got our own stories in our own homes, communities, as to those individuals who are being left behind. So for me, the concern is around the digital skills gap that we absolutely need to address. I suppose not simply the digital skills gap, but also if you're a litigant in person without legal representation, how, how do you actually navigate the system? Anything. They, they love the online system, litigants in person. I, I think we have to be careful not to build a system for the past, but to build one for the future. Of course, as I said in my, um, in my short comments earlier, we need to be astute to those that can't use the online space. But we're not saying that's the only space. We're saying that is the space for those who are comfortable with it. And as time goes by, young people are nearly all comfortable with the online space. So we need to build for the future and be very careful not to be held back uh, by the idea that um, elderly people can't use that space in all cases. By the way, many elderly people love it. And I would just add that um, in addition to uh, digital capacity building, um, there's the, the prior need of uh, addressing the need for uh, a legal knowledge uh, awareness raising um, about rights and that that is actually a fundamental uh, challenge uh, prior to even navigating an online process to know that the process is there um, that, you, that your problem is one that's susceptible to uh, resolution. I mean your, your point uh, about people not knowing they have a legal problem is absolutely spot on. In fact the, the, the problem is, is exacerbated because normally legal problems um, present themselves with uh, somebody who's lost their job, then they have a legal case, then they lose their home because they haven't been paid, then they have a property case, then they become ill as a result, then they have a problem uh, with health care. And it's a cycle of decline, as um, uh, Stephanie and I spoke recently um, with Hazel Gen, who has written eloquently about this problem. I, I mean, I am not playing down the problems of vulnerability. 
But I think this discussion is about how we create a really good civil justice system uh, for those that can use it and for the modern age. And can, I, can I just add that we also absolutely, um, and within those systems, we also have to build in appropriate you know, signage. There has to be appropriate signage that will direct individuals uh, um, and when things go wrong, that that signage directs them to, uh, to help, to appropriate help. Um, so proper signage as well. So technology, absolutely, is a, you know, we should embrace it. It has a role to play um, and, and certainly will help, hopefully, get down some of the backlog in the courts. And, I mean, that's my layer one, is, is some app or website where anybody can go who's got a problem and be sent to the right place. I think that's exactly right, that technology actually can be part of the solution of addressing this knowledge gap. Um, I love the fact that you're starting with the website. Um, yeah. Very exciting. Now, I've already got people in the audience signaling to me, so I have several people in the audience signaling to me, so where are our mics? We've got some roving mics coming, I believe. Uh, oh, somebody's pointing to them. There we are, they're emerging from the back. I've got, uh, first of all, someone in the front row, please. <laughs> someone in the front row. I've got the chief commoner in the front row. Catherine, I don't know whether I dare, as, uh, the, um, as the only non-lawyer, perhaps the room as the only journalist, ask a question, but particularly addressed to Sir Geoffrey. And in, in respect, perhaps, of the 50th percent who are 500 pounds or less, isn't what you were discussing really a blueprint moving towards, ultimately, uh, using artificial intelligence to, to determine an awful lot of these small claims? Well, I didn't mention artificial intelligence, possibly deliberately, because it's so controversial and we could have discussed it all evening. Um, actually, what I was suggesting was determination on the papers for small claims, which can normally be resolved in a very short space of time. Some claims can and are resolved by artificial intelligence, and people are very happy for it to happen. Um, there are 60 million claims every year resolved on eBay and they're very small claims, they're very small disputes. People don't care much about the outcome. They don't want to spend any money on it and they want it resolved immediately. And for that, artificial intelligence is fine. In areas where you're talking about children or people's homes or, or things that are of great consequence, artificial intelligence potentially is problematic because it may reach the right answer but justice with a human face will continue to remain important, in my view. But I'm an old judge, so why ask me? Right, I've got, I think I have a question this, here, if I can pass the mic there, and then I've got a couple towards the back. Can we take... Thank you. Thank you very much for the very interesting presentation. I'm Michel Nussbaumer from the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, the EBRD. Um, at EBRD, we have worked for many years on judicial capacity building programs in uh, Eastern European countries, countries of the former Soviet Union, and now also Arab countries. These have been very traditional projects focusing on uh, training judges on, on commercial law matters. But of course, with the pandemic, now we have, like many others, started turning our attention to uh, online courts. Um, it's um, something we are doing, for example, in Ukraine at the moment. We have a project together with the British Institute for International and Comparative Law, BICL, um, to help the Ukrainian government establish uh, online courts for small claims. This is very uh, recent work, but we can already see some issues that um, arise in, in this context. Uh, some have been mentioned by the panelists, like the use of artificial intelligence to replace judges to curb corruption, or um, the lack of IT skills in the judiciary, or um, the insufficient um, broadband access uh, in, in the country. Um, we have also done a, a survey of 20 of our countries of operations about their readiness to uh, implement online courts, and most of them are ready and very keen, so I think we can expect more requests for technical assistance in this sector. So my question to, to the panelists is, um, for uh, organizations like, like the EBRD going to developing countries to help them implement um, online courts, what should be the priorities in, in designing technical cooperation projects? What, what would be your advice? 
Who would like to start on this one? Elizabeth. Well, I will start, and it won't surprise you, given my earlier remarks. Um, I, I, I would really recommend um, uh, really grounding the intervention in data, and in particular, legal needs surveys, not just the data that is generated by the institutions, but by the users of the system. And that I think that will generate insights and, and, um, and give direction to the, to the project that um, will really reinforce its effectiveness. Um, and there's a lot, actually, there's a, on our website, we've recently published an atlas of legal needs surveys. There are dozens of these that have been carried out by different actors, civil society, national statistics agencies in many countries, and there's a, a real boom in that area, and it's a resource that can be used to help design those programs. And I think I would say the same, actually. It's horses for courses. Um, countries have very different users and very different needs. And my experience of working with African countries and Eastern European countries, and, and indeed some Arab countries, on these issues is that they look at it um, rather differently from what you might expect. Um, some African countries really think that they should put their entire justice system online. They have very remote communities, don't have access to justice at the moment at all, but they are getting uh, an internet infrastructure. Other countries don't have a very good internet infrastructure, in which case online justice would be no justice at all. So my message would be really exactly the same as Elizabeth, get the data and then decide how to proceed. Thank you. I've got three, at least three or four hands, so we'll be fairly quick. Becky, if you could... Um have had, yeah, had the mic over. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Michael. I'll be from the Bingham Centre, and thank you. A bit of feedback here. <laughs> thank you to all of our speakers for joining from all parts of the world for today. I think the first thing I'd like to say is to reiterate the Bingham Centre's position on much of this, which we brought to the House of Commons Justice Select Committee inquiry into online courts and justice in 2019 which was that more needs to be done in order to bring people who are so far away from the system that they don't even conceive of their problem as legal. One million civil justice claims a year aren't brought simply because people don't know about that part legal within their problem that enables them to get a judicial resolution, and I think that's key to understanding all of this. My question is around this presumption which is baked into online civil money claim, and I think part of Sir Geoffrey Voss's presentation, which is around £500. Miss Donoghue, when she had her gastrointestinal issues, would almost certainly have found that those problems were worth less than £500, and yet the soil of the common law would not have been watered had she not been able to bring a case that was adjudicated in a real court to actually get to the House of Lords. If she had been put into an online system, or forced to go into alternative dispute resolution, it's highly unlikely that we would have the law of negligence as it stands today. So my question is around, are we thinking a bit too much about the financial value of cases, and are there actually holistic circumstances that we should consider in order to understand where things should go into the system? Are you okay if I collect a couple more questions? Thank you, because uh, I think there were two more hands around uh, there. Yes, uh, and if people could be quick with their questions. So there and then at the back, <coughs> and then there is one here. But I'll just take two questions at a time. Uh, Michael Smith, I'm Senior Independent Director at the Legal Services Board. Uh, I'm grateful to all the panellists, but particularly to Elizabeth for putting this question of legal capability front and centre. And it's an, an attenuation of the question <clears throat> that Michael just posed, uh, and it's this. Public legal education, legal literacy, legal capability, however you refer to it, is not merely a nice to have. It's a regulatory objective placed on virtually everyone in this room it, to promote the rights and responsibilities of citizens. In that context and in circumstances where time is short, I'd like to invite uh, each panel member to identify one step, large or small, which could be taken in order to encourage legal literacy in this country, particularly in the online context. That's a great question. Thank you. Who would like to start? Which I thought uh, this end, Jeff. Well, you can, you can point, point a finger at me if you like. 
I mean, I, I personally think the, the biggest step is to get a platform that is available to all where people know that they can be directed to the right place. I know I bang on about this, but it's never been done. It was done in Belgium, but it collapsed. It was called Belmed. But actually, lots of people know they have a problem. And if you can get a single place for them to go, and it can be by app, it can be on a website, it can be by any method that reaches really a large percentage of the population, it would be a very great step forward. And it can only be done technologically. And uh, for the previous question, did you have a, a thought? And, and the, the, the previous question is really, I, I agree, of course. Um, 500 pounds uh, can be a very important case. But the systems we're designing will make sure they identify very important cases and, and get them given the importance they deserve, whatever their value. So I don't think the two are mutually exclusive. Thank you. Elizabeth. Well, I couldn't uh, agree more um, with uh, the suggestion of, of creating it one, one online place for legal information. So maybe just to offer another solution, and, and, but uh, to, to complement that, um, I would maybe think about some low-tech options, too. Um, we will continue to um, live together in communities. and. Um, even as all of this moves online, I think there's a, a continued opportunity to partner the legal profession with other professions, other um, service providers who may have closer contact with um, populations and be in a position to provide critical information and, and um, fill this legal capability gap. I think um, medical service providers, as, as Stephanie mentioned earlier in her remarks, um, educators, public libraries, and the like. So absolutely, if I could pick up the PLE, the public legal education point, you know, for me, legal rights mean absolutely nothing if you don't know when those rights are being taken away or indeed you don't know how to exercise those rights. And of course, we've spoken a great deal about those individuals who are not coming or getting advice uh, earlier. We also know that, you know, the recognition or, or the inability to recognise when individuals have a legal problem and when they do recognise they have a legal problem, where they should go to get legal advice. So for me, um, and, and, and many of you perhaps would have heard me speak about this, I'm absolutely passionate about getting law taught in schools. You know, from a young age, added to our national curriculum, and I'm told it's almost impossible, but my mother says if you don't ask, you don't get. So the point being is that, you know, if we start to teach, you know, if we think about it, we have a day, uh, a, a national day for almost everything at the moment. Why are we not teaching law in schools? The law touches every part of our lives. We cannot get away from it. You know, this room, this, the chair you're sat on, you know, everything the law touches. So we start to teach it in schools. We start to get the public thinking about the justice system, not when they're caught up in it, because that's too late. We start to, to get the public to think about the justice system earlier. A national treasure like the NHS, and that, in turn, is how we get the government to invest in our justice system. Our justice system that is revered around the world. People come from all over the world to litigate in this jurisdiction. Um, and yet our justice system, it, parts of it, is crumbling. We need the public on side. We need to start educating our young people from an earlier age. That's great. Now, I'm going to take the question from the back row, the question from the front row, and then uh, adjourn at the back, I think, for, for a conversation over drinks. Very much, uh, Mary Arden. I, I congratulate all the speakers on a very instructive session, uh, but I did want to ask one question, which arose out of something that the president of the Law Society said, uh, and it turns on the value of the role of the solicitor giving face-to-face -face advice. Uh, there's no comparison, if I may say so, between uh, justice on eBay and justice through the courts and our legal system. Uh, what I was concerned to, th to know what your views were is would all these online systems divert the energy of solicitors into that sort of litigation uh, because they would need to keep their businesses competitive and make it difficult for them to continue to provide uh, what many people need and want, namely face-to-face -face advice. It isn't answered through online systems. Thank you. And then the question in the front row. 
Thank you. Jennifer Donnelly from Keystone Law, and also I'm a mathematician at Algorithm. Um, so I was very interested by uh, what the Master of Roles said about how digital skill sets will diminish, the need for digital skill sets will diminish as the elderly population diminishes. Um, as a person who works in machine learning and algorithms, I can tell you that uh, there will be a 10-year-old who will know more than a 24-year-old today. Um, and so this is going to necessitate a bit like the, the law in, law, learning law in school, it's going to necessitate an online, an on ongoing love of digital learning because we are moving very fast. We have supercomputers now. Um, the sort of work I'm doing, you know, we're able to work out where satellites are um, when they're dispersed. So this is not going to stop and the, the, the younger people will come through, but they will also then become um, out of date. And so I think we would also need to have some sort of curriculum that keeps those people up to date, both in terms of AI and, and, and where these digital systems are going. Otherwise, there will always be people who fall behind. Thank you very much. The final round of answers from our panel. Okay. Um, well, the answer to, to Mary is that the two are not mutually exclusive again. Face-to-face um, -face legal advice will still be required, as you rightly point out. That doesn't mean that cases cannot be bulk cases and many cases cannot be fairly, properly and justly determined online. People may need legal advice in that space, but I very much doubt that solicitors will be anything will, will be diverted away from advising their clients because they have to uh, file a case online and progress a case online uh, rather than sending papers in the post. And personally, I think the two are complementary. And as regards supercomputers and the young, I couldn't agree more. I think we have to be extremely careful to understand the pace of technolo technological change and not be the 90% of stuffy old lawyers who hope they will be able to retire before any of this happens. <laughs> I have nothing to add. <laughs> yes, definitely. I mean, absolutely. You know, um, we've heard, uh, uh, anecdotally, we've heard about, you know, uh, some firms where clients like the idea of, you know, uh, uh, remote, uh, uh, remote interaction, and they're quite happy for that. And in turn, in some parts, it has driven costs down. But there are other areas, quite rightly, that will require that face-to-face. -face. So I think there will always uh, 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 be the requirement there for face-to-face. Technology has, has transformed the way that we work, the way that we have lived, uh, um, you know, for the last 19 months. And it's said that technology changed, uh, uh, you know, or, or the pandemic was able to do in 48 hours what perhaps, uh, uh, you know, would have taken the legal profession 10 years to do, and that's embrace technology. There is an absolute role for it. Um, and we've seen how it can work and when it works and your internet works and you have the right equipment, you have the right resources, the affordability and so forth, um, then absolutely there are instances where it can work and it can be very, very uh, valuable. But um, a num uh, uh, alongside the caveats that we, and the caution that we have uh, identified this evening, um, so it's a, a culmination of appropriate signage about alerting individuals to other alternative uh, uh, methods of dispute um, of resolving, um, and ensuring that people actually know where to go in the first place, which brings me back to my PLA uh, points. Great. Well, look, thank you very much for being a really responsive uh, audience. I know there's an awful lot more we could talk about. Can we just uh, thank this fantastic uh, panel of speakers that we've had, and then let's move to the back for, 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 to continue the conversation over a drink. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.